Hi, all hope you're well. Cullen here. Welcome to uh, Lawyer Lending Live. My next guest is a true, true powerhouse, and I'm sure you're going to get a lot of value. 20 years in uh, property and over a billion dollars in sales. To be revered, Mr. Steve McMenamin, CEO of House Lanco. Welcome, Steve. How are you, sir? Amazing, sir. Thank you, Callum, for having me on today. And uh, hello to you beautiful viewers. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, very excited Absolutely. to uh, participate on this platform. So here we're streaming across a few platforms, which is uh, quite exciting. We are indeed. And I will say it is a live. We are streaming live on YouTube, Facebook and uh, LinkedIn, obviously. So please put your comments in. It is live and uh, we want to hear from you currently now. Uh, 5.17, so you are watching this in real time. But my first question, Steve, what is happening in your circle of influence, my friend? What are you seeing in the market? What's going on? It's an exciting time. So uh, I'm in the building industry, so in uh, looking yes. after the front end of the client. So we had a lot of talk about uh, builders having some challenging times, some bankruptcies, some liquidations in the markets, uh, a few people hurting as well. Um, yes. So really, I guess... Guess with that side of the market, there first and foremost is just making sure the number one people, um, aka the clients, uh, are looked after. Um, and really, to get to these positions, it's the work that you do six to twelve months ago, uh, where you see the warning signs, you see the flags, you start to see a few sites get a little bit messy, and the delaying mm. communication is um, is really where uh, you start to sort of hear what's going on. Um, I feel we're getting to the other side of this. There's always, always going to be cycles, peaks and troughs, um, kind of very similar to what you're doing with the rates. There's going to be some ups, there's going to be some downs, and all you need to do really is just be able to ride it out. Ride it out. Oh, and I lo I'm endeared to what you're saying there, Steve, in terms of the warning signs, seeing mm -hmm. building sites that are um, you know, either messy or in disrepair. What should, because obviously your clients, you work with a number of clients from all walks of life, but clients that are looking to engage your services or a builder, what should be they we be watching out for? The, are the alarm bells and the flags? Yeah, yeah. so first of all, um, what I'd recommend, and, and I started off as the client myself, but always having one main point of contact, okay? So regardless of however you're buying, whether you're buying retail, wholesale or owner build or whatever you're doing, uh, but always having one person accountable. So it's much easier um, to spread the risk. But I, I recommend people have someone like myself or somebody that's an experienced consultant because we're aware of these things rather than just selling the property. So first thing is get somebody with experience that's actually built a few houses or had years in the industry, knows, you know, and they've got a bit of pull. Um, so when you're dealing with somebody, as much as I've got respect for sales cadets or new people in sales. Shout out to them. We've got, we've got respect for all that. A lot of, lot of love for them, okay? But time in the market matters. Uh, so what that means is um, we generally at the front uh, are communicating directly with the builders. Uh, we're speaking to the land agents. So first of all, what I would do is there's three parts when you're buying a new home, and it's simple. Get your money sorted. Get yes. your block of land and get your builder. Okay, so the good protection part is, is if your money's sorted, you've got a bank behind you that's going to be making your progress payments. So they're also going to come to not necessarily your rescue, but they're not going to make a payment on a house that's half complete either. No. So they're going to start. They're going to stop the funding. Second of all, if you're purchasing land, um, yes. which I would recommend speaking to your land agents, um, not that they're always going to have the vested interest because sometimes there's a additional incentives behind the scenes, but ask them which are the typical builders that prove to be most popular and get the people that are dealing with the builders on the regular um, on the regular uh, basis. Last but not least, um, dealing with the builder directly. So uh, with that said, you can't always get access to a CEO or a manager, but before paying any deposits or getting any further, uh, a couple of things I'd recommend clients or should do is A, Say they're building with a builder, let's call it um, Bob's Building. They should drive past a few of Bob's building sites and just see the progress and, once again, how many sites do they actually have in the local area. This will give yes. them a good information. If you're a little bit ballsy, maybe hop out um, and have a look, not necessarily around the site, but you can walk around the outside. Speak, speak to some of the trades. 
Um, if you really want to know what's going on, <laughs> the, the chippies and the brickies and the, and the guys laying the concrete, they'll let you know if they're happy with that company. Uh, and then last but not least, try and get into the building company itself. So um, AKA Shopfront, if they have a color gallery or they have a home address, um, go there and just make sure the thing's not a facade. Uh, so you want to be okay. hearing a nice, nice buzz, the phone's are ringing, when you're greeted by the receptionist, everything's warm and friendly. When you start to see signs of coldness or despair, um, that's typically when you know something's going to be wrong. So finance right, check the land office, and really investigate the most important um, part of the aspect, which is the building. Absolutely. And what I'm seeing, I guess, from the finance side of things, these tactics, obviously the cost of materials has blown out with the whole of the global events, supply chain shortages. Yeah. Um, builders are using the tactic of, hey, we don't think your bank is going to be able to meet settlement. If you pay us $25,000 now, it will avoid us pay, potentially charging you a variation of uh, 100000 um, and whatnot or something like that. I see that all the time. Mm -hmm. I see that every week, actually. What is your advice to buyers who get themselves into something that they're potentially going to be left with a home that's unfinished if they don't pay this kind of like mini ransom. I know there's a reason behind it. The cost of materials has increased outside of the fixed price building contract. What's your thoughts on that phenomenon? Well, this is where I, I really, I guess, in a point of contention. Obviously, I've worked on both sides of the fence here. Um, but at the end yes. of the day, you, a fixed price contract is a fixed price contract. It's not okay Correct. to say to a client, um, hey, we've got fixed price contracts and have that as a selling point. And then when the going gets tough and then say, sorry, we're now losing money, um, we need to hit you up. So if they're prepared in one aspect to charge the client a variation, they should also be prepared to take the same in a hit. Now, at the end of the day, we can't afford for builders to go bankrupt and I'm not speaking no. ill, but when they've done their costs, when they've taken their deposit, when they've signed their contract, when they've done the colour gallery point, they've had four, um, four minimum points to review their contract and their own tenders. And then they've signed it by their manager, CEO or um, chief operating officer. They've signed that contract. So really they should, A, honour it. Now, let's say they can't honour that and there's a variation thing there. One, um, full refund should be provided to the client and giving them an opportunity to pick another builder, but there's a there's a cost of time here. If you've bought in 2021 and you've signed a fixed price contract and typically they're 12 months and maybe a um, small cost of $1,000, which is written into the contract if they go over time, um, that, that should be applicable. But the issue is if they've signed a contract for $260,000, they've got in, they've, they've, they've locked in, they've been sold on a fixed price contract and they come back to buy now, they're going to unfortunately pay 300 grand for the same build. Now, you're allowed to win and lose. At the end of the day, at that point, the customer should realise the equity that they've made and, and be, you mean, mindful of that. Secondary two, if a builder is running that close to a loss, um, they shouldn't be running insolvent. Uh, and that basically means that if they can't honour the fixed price contract, and this is where the, some of the laws should be talked about at some point, um, either A, a, a governing body should come in and take over that builder, or two, um, there, there needs to be some serious discussions further around this, and I'm just trying to keep it lighthearted today. But uh, it's not okay to just take wins. Um, if you're running on a 20% profit margin, you're only going to make 5%. Honour the contracts, look after your client, and make sure they have the best build possible, and they come back and they build off you again. I love that. And it seems that that's very close to heart in what you and your team do and manage. Um, I'd love to touch on that. Like what gives your clients the edge? Because you're speaking to my network and the legal yeah. professionals that follow us and aligned professionals. Just what, what gives your clients the edge when they engage someone like yourself, Steve? Yeah, perfect. So a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, I've actually had to deal with circumstances like that similar. So we've actually had builders... Um, that couldn't um, honour contracts and, and facilitate that or go through. Um, so it, it has touched me. But what I did is I had my business absorb that. Um, we, didn't, we didn't pass on any increased costs. We found replacement builders and we actually honoured that. So 
that's one thing is integrity, I think, is most important. Um, but sort of stepping back, I guess, uh, to that is one thing that can't be bought is experience. So in this time, I've helped 1,100 families, um, 41 wow. years of age now, but 1,100 families purchase property. Um, and I've been physically selling property now for about 14 to 15 years. So that's a, that's a lot of a lot of homes. Now, I haven't helped 1,100 individuals. I've helped 1,100 families. What that means is a lot of my clients have come back or referred um, because 1,100 transactions by itself is a lot. Uh, the competitive edge is this. So let's say that 90% of people out there that build a home right now uh, and I'm sure I'd love to hear in the in the comments if, if maybe please put them in the comments. Um, I'm going to ask you what what are the questions? What do you feel is normally missing from a build contract? And I'm, I'm going to rattle off some answers, and anyone else can feel free to answer. But there's things like driveway, um, first one sometimes missed. Definitely uh, ceiling heights, whether you have a 2.4 million uh, meter ceiling height or 2.5 or 2.9, these options may not be presented to clients. Things like appliances. In display homes, people see 900 appliances, but they may get a 600 um, oven. Another thing you may forget about, kind of important, privacy would be curtains or blinds. Um, that Those items there can be anywhere from uh, $1,500 through to the sky's the limit, but 10 grand typically. And then things like air conditioning. So uh, a thing that I would commonly see come up is you have a large house with five bedrooms, two living areas, and fresco. Somebody's put in an evaporative cooling unit. That's okay. It's only got five points. Now, where are those five points going to go? They're only, if you have them to each bedroom, the living areas and the kitchen aren't cooled. <laughs> so you need to have a unit that's big enough. Um, so this, once again, comes with experience. Uh, in some cases, I've seen carpet missing. Um, carpet, you know I mean, kind of important. My goodness. Carpet. Uh, oh, carpet. it's not an essential item, Steve. Surely carpet. No, no, that's not important. Uh, good if you're an owner builder, but uh, you kind of need it. Um, but yeah, you know, I've seen people turn up with no carpet. Not in uh, not in the instances I've dealt with. But other things, very simple things, that just roll off very quickly. Landscaping, fences, blinds, cooling, letterbox, clothesline, all those little small <laughs> items. Um, they can add up very quickly. So. If your client was shopping around versus me, ask him to ask what's not included. Oh, that's, that's a good question. question. That is the question you should ask. So if you're not dealing with me, what's not included? And I'll give you one more question that kind of stumps uh, the consultants out there. Ask them, how many houses have you built with the company that you represent? And then wait. <laughs> okay. And the answer may be shocking. Well, sometimes it's zero. Or you find out they're actually building with their competitor. <laughs> um, go and work for that company. Um, many, many times I've done deals with uh, with people out there that have actually, uh, and they're in the building trade, have built with me, yet work for a competitor. Um, now, as I said, without dropping names, etc., and, and exposing the truth there, um, that's a bit the disappointing. Truth is the truth is out there. So ask them those questions. Uh, then last but not least, ask them how long have they worked for the company um, that they work for and what do they most like about it. Now, if they can answer those questions and say, look, I'm fresh, I've only been here for six months, but mum and dad have built, I've had a good experience with them so far, this is the research I've done, give them a free pass, work with them, you've done your inspection because sometimes the floor plan you want may be sitting with a builder that you didn't consider. So fair on both sides, but you, you've been warned. No, you've been warned, but... Yourself, Steve, and the Houseland Co., you're obviously doing great work because you are featured in a prominent TV show. You're filming it right now, and it's going to be released very soon. Love to touch on that. What, what does it take to become a TV star? And um, is this the uh, Lux Listings killer? <laughs> well, I'm not sure. This is the reality killer. This is Lux Listings is a beautiful show. Uh, we're more about, um, we're about mums and dads. So Come Lux on. Listings, great show, but it's, uh, it can be. We are in talks with Foxtel um, and we're looking at Channel 31, but the new it's called The New Property Show. We're going to be shot in St Kilda. Uh, the show is going to really just feature interviews with land developers, builders, uh, brokers. Love to have you feature on the show, of course, as well, Cullen. Um, Hashtag on brokers. And, uh, of course, really just what the steps are when building a new property. I don't really feel anyone's done anything like that before. I haven't seen no, it. I haven't. 
So uh, how that came about, right time, right place. Uh, I did a, I did something I didn't want to do and I helped out somebody I didn't want to help out and I did something because I said I would. Uh, and because I showed up, I had an opportunity to present itself who somebody said to me, mate, you'd be the perfect host for our new property show. So my advice is there is sometimes you've got to do tough things um, for the right causes and opportunities and you'll get back. Now, the property show will uh, feature three live audiences. Um, they'll be sitting around about 100, uh, 100 people. That'll be an opportunity to meet the TV cast and, uh, of course, uh, some canapes and drinks. And also we'll be hearing from the clients themselves what their building experience has been like with a number of builders. Uh, we're trying to do this interview impartial, so I'm not coming on as the expert, but more the host and an educational platform, so we're unbiased as far as we can be. We'll be interviewing the big builders, so if there's big builders watching, love to have you on the show. We'll be interviewing wholesale builders, um, so wholesale builders are the ones that are doing the full turnkey products, and of course, a few mums and dads that just decide they want to do it themselves. <laughs> Um, they've gone and owner, owner occupied much harder to do those types of build, but we want to hear the pros and cons of doing it yourself as well. That's it. That's so exciting, mate. And I have no doubt it's going to be a roaring success. Um, and I, I'm endeared by what you're saying about the mums and dads. Look, Lux Listings, I love the show. Um, Simon Cohen and the team on there, they look fantastic. They do a great job, but obviously not based in the reality of what most of Australia is dealing with. Um, and I think it's great to have something like that down to earth. What do you want to know? What do you want to know about what's happening in your, in your own lives? Um, I guess switching gears a bit in terms yeah. of um, like in terms of lending, the banks came out, one of the banks came out with 300,000 Qantas points to refinance and they thought it was going to be great. They thought they were going to go gangbusters, but what they realized very soon into it was most people don't care about an overseas trip at the moment. Most people are thinking, what am I going to do when um, the rates go through the roof and I can't even afford my own mortgage repayments and whatnot? Um, are there things at the stage when they engage you, clients that are doing this build and whatnot, can save on costs because every dollar counts, right? What are the, the top yeah, key cost savings that they can do? Okay. So uh, first of all, uh, a common mistake that's made out there, um, let's just go back to the days when I was in retail, is clients, uh, and they're entitled to, they would go out and pay three deposits. Um, they might pay a two grand, two grand, and two grand and get yes. their best quotes and, and times, that sort of stuff. I've seen that many times. Two people lose, one person wins. Half the time they end up coming back and you see it on the review, should have gone with a builder that was in the middle. <laughs> that's what they. Should, that's one thing. Um, secondly, uh, making sure that all the costs are incorporated in the, in the contract. For example, if you were to do a $300,000 build, and yes. we would agree minimum you need $20,000 worth of additional extras, uh, landscaping, fences, clients calling, what we talked about, that's minimum. Uh, that $20,000 is typically going to cost the average Australian $40,000 because it's got to pay tax on that. They're also going to have to save that money, which is going to take them time. Find a builder typically that will include that as much as possible uh, in the build contract. So that's the first thing you do. Get as much as you can in the build contract. Because if it's going to be an investment property down the track or it's going to be uh, an owner-occupier, most of the times it's going to be tax deductible. Also, it's going to come with a builder's warranty. Mm -hmm. Second of all, a um, couple of small things that they can do to really do some cost savings is really um, buying their land at the right price. So we're focusing a lot on the build, but if you're buying the right block, that's 300 grand and you pick it up at 280, you're already 20,000 ahead. So Good point. where I would recommend going to buy land if you weren't engaging my services would be apart from realestate.com, which I, I think you should always be educated. Um, you can go to websites such as homely.com.au. Uh, uh, another really good place to source land is Open Lot. Um, okay. Another word of caution, but another great place to get land is Gumtree. Um, now, uh, I don't recommend doing any money under the table or any secret deal. <laughs> Make sure you go see the people. Um, but I have heard of some good deals being done on Gumtree. And the reason for that is they're people that don't want to engage real estate agents or they're trying to make a quick buck. And then last but not least, the other suggestion you can do is you can still negotiate with the land guys. Um, I know there's going to be some land people here watching. 
But There's lots of land people watching. Come on, make yourselves known in the comments, guys. So I would recommend putting an offer in. Uh, for example, if something's 300 grand, test the market at $280,000 and a 30-day settlement. Uh, at the moment, because the prices are escalating with the builds, there may be some, um, some lightning of the land. Where land might have been on the market for five days, that may be stretching out to 30 to 60 days now. So uh, the developers and the land agents may be open to offers uh, and getting some, some savings made there. Uh, and the last thing you can do is really just compare your bill prices. So I recommend it before not paying a bill um, in terms of paying deposits, but yes. make sure you've got things like fixed site costs. How long is my price hold? Um, how much do I expect to spend in the color gallery? And remember that you're buying a house nowadays more for practicality than you are for luxury. Um, there would have been a, probably a Lux listings maybe five years ago with Stevie Mac. <laughs> nowadays it's called practical listings. Um, you're buying it. <laughs> What a show name. That's a great show name. Uh, what I recommend, though, is if when you're buying a home, is treat it like you would an investment property. The real way to wealth is through accumulation. So don't go all out on your first house. Buy a four-bedroom, two-living area plan that you can use as a stepping stone and don't focus on the pennies, focus on the pounds. So see how you can actually build into, move into that property, create equity, value add it, and then lease that out and build another one. Fantastic. Cogent insights there, Steve. And um, we, I get this question a lot because it's not very well understood. From a lending side of things, the bank look at the land value. And mm -hmm. in most cases, when you've got a fixed price building contract, um, the simple formula is land value plus that. They add it together, they get the end value of um, the property and the bank can mm -hmm. lend on that. Lawyers, shout out to you. You can borrow 90% no LMI. However, I've heard conversations that builders and um, I guess your competitors there, Steve, will go to the client and say, oh, look, when we build this, they may not value it. It might be 50 grand under what it is. Just expect that. Um, is that an alarm bell? Should people be worried when their builder says, oh, we don't think that the uh, property is going to stack up to what we put in the contract? Is that a reflection on the market or is that a reflection on them? I'd love to get your uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, I might give you a few answers on that because there's there's no one fixed answer. Uh, depends if if you're the day that you're the builder or not. Now, uh, the answer is to this. So the, the terminology that they want to use there is what's called shortfall. Okay, so uh, I would always make sure no matter what, you have enough money to uh, to complete your build. If you're unsure of getting the finance, then secure the land first, at least you're halfway there, then get the build. And if you don't get approved, at least you still own the land, okay? If you put house and land together, I'm not trying to make you double dip here, but if you put house and land together, if one falls over, so does the other. Okay, so there's a bit of an issue there. Now, what you can do to get around that, um, A, uh, okay, you could you could actually ask that question, why do you feel this price is not going to value up? Has this happened before? Has it happened recently? So ask a few more questions there. Secondary to that, the, uh, the reason some of that may actually happen at the moment, so to be fair, on the middle, is that the pricing of building has gone up. So if comparable sales in the area for established houses are 500 grand and you've got a build now that's 550, the valuer still needs to do what he needs to do or she needs to do and be conservative and protect the bank's interest. Because funny enough, they're not there for the customer. Uh, the valuer is no. there actually for the bank. The bank, you need to make sure if the bank needs to sell, that's it. So they're always going to lean towards the lower of the numbers, and that's okay. Um, last but not least there, what you can do is depending, and this comes more into the lending side, but I recommend um, different banks for different regions. Now, I'm not a broker, but I know that, for example, Bank of Queensland is going to value Queensland a lot better than maybe a, I don't know, Bank of Melbourne or a, or a Westpac because they're not doing as many deals. Unfortunately, when you're doing money deals in those areas, uh, in most cases, and I don't want to cross the line here with the brokerage, but you should go where and almost be a sheep. You should go where the money is. If CBA is valuing all the properties at the right price, um, do that. And the other thing too, long term, uh, a lot of mums and dads have been talked out of deals from backyard barbecues where they've thought there's been a shortfall. Remember, it's a long-term game. Ask yourself if the property is 550 now 
and it's going to be worth a million dollars in in 10 years, am I prepared to tip in a little bit more money if need be? If it doesn't feel right, gut feel, don't go ahead anyway. That's a good that's a good point. And you're right there, Steve. There are banks that value and have a better system in place. I got off the phone with the state manager before, Michael Piper from the CBA, and they do what's called a um, desktop or Conval, and it usually comes in on contract price. So not leaning towards CBA anywhere. They're a great well option. Done, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good on you, Michael. You managed to get it on the show, Mr. Piper. Um, we call him the commissioner here because his phone rings like Batman. That's how often we're yeah. calling him. Um, yeah. But I want to ask you, you this there, Steve. Someone is watching and they're ready to go. They're about to make a move on an established property or take a punt on the, the house and land or construction route. What are the benefits, one or the other, and what should they be considering before they go, you know what, I'm going to give Steve a call and see what I can do? Okay, so benefits of using my service is what you're saying, or is that correct? Is that exactly, the question? Yeah, correct. Yep. Correct. Okay. Um, over okay, established so, property. Oh, over established, easy. Uh, okay, so two things. Um, I don't lose either way. So I like property. I'm happy to talk to people whether they're buying established or they're building new. Uh, a real property investor is happy to talk about property either way. As long as the person speaking to me is respectful of their time and I'm respectful of theirs, I'm happy to have that conversation. Sometimes it's better to buy established, and that might be to do with school zones. The fact if you're building in CBD, there's just no land within 10 kilometres of that, so I can't compete. Um, And you're buying established typically if you can value add the property. So, for example, 700 square metre block and you can get two houses on there or you can get three or four at one point or you want to evaluate. So I used to do some seminars um, prior to getting into new property and you want to look at value adds. So turning a two bedroom into a three bedroom, a three bedroom into a five or an Airbnb and established properties. One of the other advantages is you see what you get. The disadvantage is this, you're paying stamp duty. um, You don't have warranty and your depreciation schedules um, are not going to be to the maximum. And there's typically going to be a lot of repairs on most properties that are hidden because most people want to present them. And you're also dealing with uh, a third party, which is typically the sales agent that may or may not call you call you back. You could go to auction. You could overpay, um, overpay. So you're typically not in control with established properties. With building a property, you have the control. So if you're the client, you have the control. The reason is you can pick your, um, typically pick your lender, you can pick the location, and you can pick your builder. So I would recommend established properties, uh, uh, sorry, I recommend new properties over established properties purely for the fact that you get a choice. If you want to choose the colour of the carpets, the appliances, the walls, and you want to value add the property, you can build it from scratch and it, Kind of like me, I kind of like new clothes over second hand. Um, just feels better, so it's uh, it's just the best way to go. Plus, builders warranty as well. Now, using my services, uh, very very quick. Um, I quickly establish, and a lot of my clients nowadays are investors over first home buyers and second home buyers. And the reason for that is they're typically time poor, and we're making the process easy. We're looking at hot spots, and we're looking for areas with high growth. So, if the people that are watching want to make money in a quicker time, of course, they should give me a call. If they want to go it alone and not build a team, they can learn costly mistakes and then not have someone representing them. It doesn't matter when things are not going wrong. It only matters if something goes wrong to have the right people on your team, kind of like insurance on your car. You hope not to use it, but you want to know if something goes wrong, one phone call and you're fixed. Um, The rest is on my bio. It's on Google. Um, You can follow it. But I think that a billion dollars in sales and 1,100 properties later, uh, the experience there should matter. And the other thing too is I'm happy to have the conversation with anyone that's watching. And sometimes I've helped people build a new property and then I've helped their son purchase an established property. So if you're in the family, uh, we're here to help you for life. Fantastic. And a final question for you, Steve. Does yep. the rising rate market help or hinder what you do for your clients? Uh, well, it doesn't really affect me too much. It, it, there's a couple of things that it does affect. So I'll give you something that I heard from Mark Boris the other day. 
So Mark Boris was saying that for every 0.5% interest rate hike, or the RBA is moving their 0.5%, if you are borrowing a million dollars, that affects you by about $50,000 rule of thumb for your lending. So if you're on the, on the line of your borrowing capacity, yes, the answer is it affects me. Uh, but typically, if I'm dealing with um, investors, whether the rates go up or down, it's tax deductible. Um, the thing that normally picks up and the people that are affected the most, unfortunately, would be the tenants. Um, if rates go up, good news is, is so does your rental. <laughs> um, there's, you're allowed to, with inflation, um, you're allowed to increase your rental by up to about 10% before there's some issues. So if, that's, if that comes through, uh, the people that normally pay it is the tenants. So my advice is there, don't be a tenant, be the landlord. Oh, I love that. And Adasa, who's been tuning in, says, great, appreciate it, and a great investment indeed of your time. Steve, thank you so much for joining us for an episode three of Lawyer Lending Live. You're a true property powerhouse, mate. And lastly, where can people find you? Where are you most active, my friend? LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, YouTube? Yeah. So Steve McManaman, on LinkedIn. Uh, find me on Facebook and, of course, on Instagram, Steve underscore McManaman. Uh, happy to talk to anybody on any channel. Uh, and mobile 0412-224-228 if they wish to flick me a text. Thank you. Fantastic there, Steve. Really appreciate it. And looking forward to seeing that TV show come out. Beautiful. Thanks again, Colin. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, Steve. And thanks all you viewers for joining another episode of Lawyer Lending Live. We'll be uploading this as special content to the Law Live podcast. Have a great Wednesday evening. Chat soon.